someone gives me a million pounds to come up with an idea for them, a million pounds, and I can't tell them about the idea in a way that makes them not just want to do it, but have to do it. How could that be their fault? How could that be their fault? It's tr- how? Could it possibly be their fault? They're paying you. How could it be their fault? And I was like, I love the emphasis you put on us. It's all on us. If you don't sell something, it's not on them. It's on your articulation, your compass, your framework for how you talk about that idea. And my guest today knows a thing or two about selling an idea. As co-founder of one of the hottest creative agencies in the planet, Uncommon, Niels Leonard has built a serious resume when it comes to creative advertising. He's won multiple Grand Prix awards at Cannes Lions and driven viral campaigns with British Airways, Nike, Monzo and EA Sports, just to name a few. Not to mention the Business Insider named him as the number one creative person in advertising globally. I use this time with Niels to break down the problems that the finance industry faces when it comes to being creative and building an emotional connection with customers. We chat what separates the meaningful from the mediocre, what's really behind fear, trust and emotion, and the urgency for change in financial services. Now, here's my conversation with Niels. Hey Niels, how's it going? Hello, Uh, I'm good man, thanks for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. Look, as, as I've been on this journey on this podcast, I cannot explain to you how many people have said you've got to go and speak to Nils. Uh, your message on creativity uh, through your work at Uncommon and you know your own narrative out to the market seems to have tapped into something culturally right now. Um, but today we're going to talk like about money. We're going to talk about how CMOs can work great with agencies. But I just want to start with your abridged, finomized version of that narrative that you have around creativity for everyone. Well, no pressure. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess uh, I'll try and do it really, really fast for you. I, get, I spent many years working in ad agencies and all that sort of stuff. And actually what I saw is that the word creativity in particular had become a slightly weak word and actually had been overused and misunderstood and replaced by lots of other language and actually... Um, really wanted to think very hard when I launched the studio about what I meant by that word and what sort of work I thought that we should be making. Um, The closer I looked at it, the more I realized that actually I think that creativity is is what humans do when they're trying to survive. That's the best version of it, is that it's a survival mechanic, that it's this thing we do when we're in trouble or frustrated or in pain or or threatened or, you know, any of that stuff. That's when the real good stuff comes and it's primal and it's fundamental, you know, and I think that that applies to brands too. Um, You know, a bit closer to home, there's a a chart we always show people uh, with a quote from Death of a Salesman, which says, I'm not interested in stories about the past or any crap of that kind because the woods are burning. There's a big blaze going on all around. And and in the book of the play, I don't know if you know it, he sort of screams at these cynics, you know, that the woods are burning and he wants them to feel this impending doom and be motivated by it. And it struck us as a brilliant quote for our industry originally, but actually for the world, really, you know, in a wider sense. And if you start a studio or start a brand, you don't really start it in a category. You sort of start it in the world. And so we were like, well, look, the woods are burning, you know, all around politically, ethically, morally. There's this amazing moment, very tender moment that we all play a part in. Slightly closer to home, if you run a brand, three quarters of brands could disappear and no one would care. That's an actual stat. IKEA's head of sustainability has said that we've reached peak stuff. It's the idea that we're full, that in the West now we're full. We don't want more. We want a different relationship with the products and brands in our lives. And then lastly, on our side of the fence, if you make advertising, people are paying money to avoid you. So actual money to avoid you. So those are the woods burning in our world. And, and really, if you view it that way, um, you might create a different type of work. You, you might create a more meaningful, more memorable, more ferocious um, type of work and ultimately at some point hopefully you might matter and that's that's the uh that's always been the vision of the studio and that still remains the vision of the studio you know and and what i've discovered and then i'll shut up and hopefully have done have done our, our mission some some you know decent honor but what i've discovered is that we tend to work with people who see the world a bit like we do you know we, we tend to not be the people you come to in a design sense in a in a build sense in an architectural sense or even an advertising sense uh, if you want a slightly different shade of blue, that's probably not, you don't go to Uncommon for that. You tend to come to Uncommon because somewhere in your world, the woods are burning and it's a massive moment of change and you want to renegotiate your place in the world. Um, and we tend to have, have good fortune with, with clients or with partners that see the world that way. So I guess that's us in a, in a nutshell. 
That was a very good whistle stop tour. Um, what I'm curious though is like, why do you think it's resonating so strongly? Because, you know, it is true. Whether it's down to you know the amount of the you know the pressure from performance marketing, the amount of data that is available, it just feels like there is a lot of sort of mediocre work around at the moment. You know, it's very difficult. Even you know speaking tone, it's like what is cutting through at the moment. Like, why do you think that is? Well, there's oh my god, that's a huge question. I mean, there's two there's two reasons I think our our narrative is chiming with people. And before I get to the the actual client side or the work side, that the first is that most people in creativity, they want to matter. They want what they make and what they spend hours making to be meaningful and be referred to and to be something they can ring their mum and talk about or talk to their partner about. You know, I went to this this creative festival in Germany once and they had these blank gravestones on fly posters down the left of the of the festival. And at the end, someone had written, you know, their name and put content solutions on it. And I thought, fuck, you know, that is not it. That is not it, man. And I was like, um, I, I, I don't, and I don't think anybody does, want to wake up and be the person that just made some content for, for 30 years. And yeah. so when you talk about the woods burning and when all of us get out of bed in the morning and when we talk about purpose-driven work or we talk about anything, all we're really trying to do is, is matter and leave something in the world that, that might have made it a slightly better place, I think. And that doesn't have to be saving the world with ecologically driven CSR initiatives. I just mean that you may have made something that someone in the future might refer to. And I think that's all any of us are trying to do. So, so from an employee point of view, I think the people that chime at Uncommon and the people that chime with our mission in the world are, are sat there feeling the same, which is, I don't want to do all of this for nothing. You know, and I don't want to do all of this for the ungrateful. And I don't want to do all of this for people less ambitious than me. Um, so that's, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that when you try to chase that, I think you make a type of work that avoids the, the landfill of gigabyte CAC that we are currently making. Despite all of the, you know, eulogies to digital when it arrived, you know, oh, it's not telly, it's not one way anymore. Ironically, it's more one way than it's ever been. There is a, a vomit of, you know, low cost, optimized, supposedly intelligent work forcing its way into our lives. And I think if you, if you recognize your place in that, and you decide not to really try to part, play a part in that, I think that's probably going to lead to some more original thinking as well. So I think there's two sides to it, you know, but I, I think there's also one last thing, which is if you run a brand and you exist in that world, there's a point at which you've sold enough things on Instagram and you can't sell any more things on Instagram anymore. And then you start asking yourself all the big fundamental questions like, what are we actually about? And what do we actually want people to think about us? And if we had no money and Instagram didn't exist, who would we be? And I think that's an amazing question because uh, most brands don't know the answer to it. And also probably what so many brands around the world are asking themselves now their Facebook ads are a bit more expensive. What is it that you would, can you pinpoint or at least paint a picture for us with an example, the difference between, you know, good creative work and, you know, work that's going to stand the test of time is excellent work, you know, is the stuff that you're striving for. We talk a lot about reference points. We, we want our work to be a reference point. We want the studio to be a reference point. I'm dreaming that someone in 25 years will say, do you remember Uncommon? Um, you know, I really do. And, and do you remember that thing they made? And love or hate it, you know, we made a thing here called Rat Boot in New York for the launch of the studio here for Fashion Week, which was a pair of high-end apparel boots that a rat could live in the bottom of. Um, we did it to get noise. We did it to be talked about. We did it to be known as creative and, and naughty and all the above, but it, it got 150 million views. It got more views than the Super Bowl, you know, and that's the world we're living in. Now that doesn't matter except it sort of does because it says, this is the stuff that our attention is focusing on Com completely. Conversely, the work, the London studio has done with ITV, uh, around Britain, get talking, which, you know, for mental health, which we're all very au fait with now. We're like mental health. Yeah. When we launched that work six years ago, mental health was not something that the UK in particular was actually talking about. Um, and we stopped national television. We've made now the most recognized mental health campaign in the UK with that work. And so I look at that and go, love or hate it, it's undeniable. And it's moved a needle and it's arguably left the world, the UK, a slightly better place as a result of it. I know it has. It's created over 100 million conversations. So that's the sort of stuff I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, on both sides of the coin, you know, from the brash and the trashy and the insanely memorable to, you know, something like Britain Get Talking or the One Second Suit. Um, those are examples of our work, but Vote the Assholes Out by Patagonia. I mean, how can a label 
make its way around the world, you know, and, and I'm obsessed with this, dude. You know, I look at out of home now and I think out of home has become the new social. You know, you, you run a poster campaign now and all of these things I grew up with, you know, the, the simple skills of writing, convictions, art direction, clever visuals, provocations, all this stuff that, that frankly was the bread and butter of the industry are now eulogized as insane and magic, <laughs> you know, and I, I find that quite funny, but I, I'm also very grateful for it. Um, so a lot of our poster work, you know, the Guardian Hope is Power work ran during the, uh, you know, when we were voting ourselves out of Europe. And so it was incredibly timely. It was almost a, a poster campaign for Uncommon's view as much as it was for the Guardian. But, it, you know, again, that, that sort of stuff mattered. So, yeah, I, I just think that's the sort of stuff we're trying to make. And others make that type of work, too. And they've probably got methodologies around it, too. But that's our... That's our way of looking at it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned methodologies because some of the time I want to spend with you today is, is unpacking that because the mental health campaign is a perfect example. What brand doesn't care about mental health? You know, it's one of those values and, and, and sort of CSR initiative. It's something that every brand does, but no one cuts through, but you were, you were able to do it. So I think if we can spend some time today breaking, not specifically that campaign, but just the process of how you make work really stand out and cut through, I think that'd be valuable. But before we do... I want to talk about money and, you know, I know you've got opinions on how, yeah, I want to talk money. That's, that's what we're here for. But you've got opinions on how the ad agency, ad, ad world thinks about uh, money in itself. We've got, you've worked with finance brands, you know, every sort of level of, of the spectrum. But when I look around and, you know, again, a big catalyst for me starting this to speak to some of the best marketers out there in finances, I look at every website in finance and this isn't a new phenomenon and both in the fintech end and the traditional end, and they're all, they're all the same. If you're an old wealth manager, you've got a happy retiree with a nice watch and a nice car playing with their kids on their lawn. Or if you're a private bank, you've got a jet and a, a cello lying around and a, and a leather sofa. Or if you're a fintech, you know, you've got sort of a fun motif and, and, and everyone has the same font, which means that the opportunity to stand out right now is huge because there's mm. homogeny, but they all talk about themselves. They all try and sell their products. And it just seems especially pronounced in finance. So I wanted to ask you why you think that is. Yeah, um, we love financial services brands, actually, as a crew. Uh, Luce and I, my strategic founder, Lucy Jameson, and I worked on HSBC way back when. And we love it for, for the same reason, which is the woods are burning, right? Okay, apply it to that world, okay? Apply it to the world of money, be it wealth or even just everyday banking. Um, and our relationship with money. You know, that the average person in the UK has learned everything they need to know by the age of seven, you know, uh, about money, which is insane, you know, that we don't understand or have a dynamic with saving that is functional in any healthy way, all that other stuff. But as you say, that the category is, is terrible, is the most, you know, um, insatiably uh, attractive thing, you know, and, and I just look at it and go, really, the truth of the financial category is I think they do this thing. They wake up and they go, we want to matter. We want to be famous. And then someone says, but we need to be trusted. And that word trust, I think, is, is at the heart of all of the cowardice in that category. You know, because somehow the category's talked itself into believing wrongly that to be trusted, you have to be emotionless. Um, but name a person that you would trust if they didn't have any emotions. You would never trust a person. You know, the, the most emotional people, the most true ones, the most real ones are the people you end up trusting the most because you understand their motivations. So when a bank or a, a company like that try to be trusted by being homogenous and emotionless, ultimately it does the opposite. I think you sort of go, they just want my money. Um, well, I think, I think that, that lens, let's stick on that for a bit because it's such a powerful question to ask. Yourself. Like, instead of thinking yourself as a, a brand, think of it as a, your product as a person. Think of your brand as a person and who would you trust? And, you know, there's consistency is important, but it, it's emotional, right? Like it's pure emotion. Think of your brand as a person, but also think of yourself as, as in need of that brand, as a customer or as a person that wants it. You know, there is this brilliant thing we do in this industry where we write ads for other people. That's when we tend to make our worst work. Um, I was at Gray and we were working with HSBC and, and they gave us the global small to medium sized businesses brief. And it was like amazing brief. And we made shit work for like three months and I couldn't work out why. And I was like, what is, and I realized everyone was writing for this mythical small business that they didn't understand. And I was like, no, where a, where a small business, where the, and actually suddenly then all the emotion pours in the need, the fear, the growth, the risk, all those excellent, juicy human subjects suddenly become real. And then we started making great work. I would argue, you know, HSBC lift and, 
a few others, which was an analogy, frankly, for the ups and downs of running a business and trying to maintain a family. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's this thing that we do where we divorce ourselves in the, in the industry from, from our consumers, particularly when it comes to money. Uh, we all try to grow up in inverted commas as opposed to taking on the realities of it. So, you know, when I talk about money, I, I love to talk about the realities of money, which are it's anything but money. It's freedom. It's independence. Uh, it's the ability to divorce yourself from difficult situations. It's progress. You know, it's fear or bravery. It's the things that hold you back or allow you to move forwards in life. It's all of those levers and gears. You know, it's the reasons you do or don't live the sort of life you wish you could live. You know, some, some of the world's most amazing psychologists have sort of gone, what would you do if money wasn't a thing? You know, and they ask that question 10 times to people. And the reason they do that is to remind people that money isn't a fucking thing, that they can just go and live their life and they will find a way for money to happen alongside it. And I just, so I think it's crippled us and our relationship with money and our relationship with money marketing has, has crippled us and it's crippled that category probably in many ways. That's why you don't see much work that you, that you think is great. And talk to me about, you know, there's, there's no end of briefs out there, right? So ambitious banks, fintechs, large institutions are looking to, you know, resonate and matter. They give you a call. How do you go in there and see that process through to the end? Like, do you have to go in and convince yeah, this question. company that they need to get out of their, out of their, you know, safeguarding themselves? Like, how do you approach Look, that? I mean, there's so much here, dude. I love this conversation. I mean, first of all, we ask everybody why they came to see us. Now, that sounds insanely simple, but most companies don't. I certainly didn't at Gray. I was like so grateful they came. I was like, oh, my God, it's HSBC. Let me show you all my stuff. Look how good I am. And, of course, the problem with that is in your head, you have this fantasy for that brand, and they came to see you for your ferocious creativity. They may have come to see you for your diligently, consistently boring P&G work. Now, if you don't ask, you don't know. So uncommon you know, we don't have diligently boring P&G work, but we do have different types of work. And so when we say, hey, why have you come to see us? The clients that tend to do best, a bit like this chat, go, oh, I saw you wanging on about, you know, the woods are burning, or I saw that piece of work for B&Q that was actually about building a life, and we fucking want one of those, you know, or I saw the purpose of your visit work, and, you know, and then you know what leg you're standing on. You kind of understand the relationship you're going to have. And that first question, that first interaction is critical. Because what I've learned is um, when you just try to win, you work your ass off for three to six months. You do everything you can possibly do. You finally end up working with them. And then you scratch your head six months later wondering why they're not making the brazen, ferocious, creative work you wanted. They didn't come to you for it. Yet when you start the conversation completely differently and you put the brief on the wall, and we do this all the time, you know, and a lot of the time this is the most emotional thing the client has said. It's never the brief. It's the moment when they go, I just want people to say, holy shit, did you see that ITB thing? And like, great. Dame Carolyn McCall said that to me. I was like, right. I pinned that on the fucking wall. I was like, that's the brief, guys. There's other things like sell more entertainment or drama, but that's the real brief. And I'm like, at that point, you, you're liberated and you're both on the same page. You know, you both have the same thing on your lists, uh, you know. And, and I think at that point, then everything else is just a journey to, to that place. Um, I often think as well, and I hate, I hate the word fear or I, I hate the word brave marketing. I find that annoying. Um, Why? Uh, because I think my wife said it better than I ever will. But my wife once said, I said to her, I was going to talk at a, a marketing festival called Fearless Marketing or something like that. And she said, um, fuck off. You don't get to talk about bravery. Firemen get to talk about bravery. You sell cheese. Um, but you said you, this was, you work, it was Parmesan, was it? something like that um, <laughs> but, uh, but I hate it because I actually think the moment we're starting to talk about bravery it means it's not a necessity it means it's some sort of indulgent stretch whereas if you take the real meaning of the woods are burning and you take the real category as it stands around you and you take people's hatred of advertising and hatred of brands and their lack of attention and all those other things frankly it removes fear because the only choice you have is to try to be noticed to be referred to to matter to be remarked on to be shared at that point, there's no fear. The fear you should have at that point is the fear of being completely irrelevant, you know, and continuing like you are. And, and that's the reason I hate it. So when we try to meet people, we try to remove fear by creating the parameters for success. And those parameters tend to be to be noticed, to be remarked on, to move the needle, whatever they are. They're emotional. They're not just the rational ones. Like, you know, we'd like 10 million new subscribers. It's like, yeah, fine. How are we going to do that? Um, 
and, and those are the things that we try to, to, to create in the dynamic. So you, That's your important. answer. Sorry, just, uh, just on the, the end of it, it's important to say to you because truthfully, pitches or new meetings are a product of frustration. You know, when a, when a CMO or a CEO, arguably in our case a lot of the time, decides they need wholesale change or they are in trouble or something has to change, that's the result of a, of a moment of fear, frustration, panic, whatever. That's great because there's energy in all of that. And if that person, that CMO, really gets that right, they decide to themselves what the parameters of success are and they don't veer from it. And it will be tempting to veer from it through the whole process, particularly as it gets more senior, particularly as it gets more real, because you'll be doing things you've not done before probably. But you have to remember the energy of originally why you created that process. And I think that's an important uh, thing to say. So I guess your, your your answer to the question of, you know, why the financial services, why do they suck at getting really bold, creative out there, not brave, um, is fear. Yeah. Well, fear, but, but that word trust, you know, which is, but we deal in hundreds of millions of pounds of people's money. So we have to be trusted. We can't be zany or emotional or, you know, and, and I think that suddenly at some point a grown up and a very clever person, usually with the, the you know, an F in their C-suite title says, uh, you know, what is this nonsense? Can we just tell them that, that their money's safe and that it's going to grow here? Um, you know, and, and I think that really a lot of the decisions are locked in that. Whereas I think if the parameters of success are we are forever going to establish ourselves with what money really brings you or we're going to forever associate ourselves with what having major wealth is really about. Let's talk about that very quickly. Like major wealth is never really about the boat or the plane. It's not. It's about access. It's about scarcity. I want a different type of life. I want the type of life I imagine for myself. I want the type of girlfriend or boyfriend I imagine for myself. I want the type of um, morning and moment I imagine for myself. I want to walk past the velvet rope, past the shut door, past the place I shouldn't or couldn't ever go possibly. That's really what money's about. It's the ultimate unlock. Those are the benefits. Then when you start playing in the negatives, you're like, well, what's the, what's the benefit of, of safeguarding your money? Well, it allows me to be free. You know, the fuck off fund didn't happen by accident. It was somebody deciding actually to say, what's really stopping me living the life I want to live? Well, it's actually my dependency on money. And so if I have enough money to tell anybody in the world to go and do one, then I might actually be free. That's the real benefit, independence. Well, as well, I mean, the other thing about great brands is they sort of hold a mirror up to you as the customer. And we were speaking to uh, Johan, uh, one of the best wealth marketers ever, uh, you know, CMO at UBS for sort of 15 years. And his whole point was, I think, you know, one of these key campaigns was just asking those questions that you ask when you have wealth, like, am I a good father? You know, that's really what the client is thinking every single day. And actually, you know, after speaking to all of their clients, when they see the picture of, you know, the banker running to the plane on the private jet, just getting the document signed in time, they're like, my life does not look like that. And you're just holding up something, especially if, if a marketer is not from that world, you're holding up something to your client that says, I don't understand you. This is what I think. Oh, that's right. That's exactly right. And I also think it's not enough. This kind of mirror marketing stuff is quite dangerous because I think sometimes you can veer into viewing success as, is this an accurate portrayal of their life? Whereas that's still not enough. I actually think you have to go past that too. What is the new truth this person hasn't heard before? What is the, what is the version of events that they feel but can't express? That's our job. And once you land on that, that's when you make famous work because someone goes, that's fucking sick or, oh my God, yes. Or that's going to leave the world better than they found it. Or I just want to be a part of that. That When that stuff happens, that's when you're really, really onto it. And that's about far more than a mirror. That's about expressing something, a conviction or a truth in a way that no one's heard before. That is so true. And and in a world where, you know, I guess agency world is like this, but, you know, back to this wealth management world, it's very similar. It's, it's word of mouth relationship driven. You know, your goal yeah. has to be organic, word yeah. of mouth, virality. And you have to be able to communicate in a way that someone stops in their tracks, watches your work, and then goes and shouts about it. And you're not going to do that. You know, I think the trust example is great, right? Like agencies, in a similar way to financial services, you're selling trust. You're selling an intangible. You're selling something that hasn't, it's not like a, you know, a, a milkshake that you can hold up and say, look, you're going to buy this. It's, it's a promise that we're going to do something great in the future and, and it's all covered. But the, to think that, okay, I need to, I, you know, we sell trust. So I'm going to 
tell tell you that I that you should trust me. And back to that analogy of a person, the person comes up to you and says, you need to trust me. That's the last person you want to trust. Well, that's right. But, but here's a bigger thing, which is, uh, I mean, Steve Jobs has said this far better than I ever will. But your immediate response to that would be, well, why? And that's what marketing and branding or narrative or all this is really about is, well, why do you wake up every morning versus somebody else? You know, and the people that work with Uncommon arguably work with us because they see the world a bit like us. There's no new news there, man. That's exactly the same as any brand in the world, which is why do you bank with them? Because they see the world a little bit more like I do. Or I want to see the world a little bit more like they do. Even better, right? If you can get there. Um, and I think that's, that's really it, which is it's about explaining your values. Why do you wake up every day and make what you make? And I think that's what most people miss too. They're obsessed with what do they want? You know, I, I mean, this is a weird reference for you, but I saw this, um, was it Noel Gallagher thing? where he was like, why is everyone obsessed with what, trying to give everybody what they want? He said, no one wanted the Sex Pistols. No one wanted Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix woke up with Jimi Hendrix and forced it down people's throats until they fucking loved it. And actually, sometimes we have to remember we're additive. You know, you don't build brands to create more of the same. You don't build brands to say some publicly known thing. You build them to do something new and to be remarkable and to actually fulfill something in your heart you know no one's done. That's the real reason someone makes something. Um, Which I guess is the, it really lands on like, what is creativity here? Because especially from a, you know, a product, a product business, you know, we're a product, we, our whole business is built around building products and taking on customer feedback. Whereas yeah. the creative world is like, okay, what's not on that list of features that they've requested? Yeah. Well, the creative one, I mean, honestly, I, it, it, never mind most of the industry, which I think has got itself addicted to content, integration, synergy, time, logistics, whatever you want to call it, which by the way are fine, but they're not the same thing as creativity. What uncommon sell is creativity. And we are for that very niche, but very valuable part of the world that just want that in its purest, most radical sense and believe in that and its power to transform. And I, I think that's what we try to sell radically. And I think when people come, we're very clear about that. It doesn't have to be the same color or the same type or the same tone. But why people come to Uncommon is for that step change. They come usually in a moment of change for a moment where we can renegotiate their place in the world. And by the way, like particularly in this category, I think there's another massive thing that they've not woken up to, which is currently there seems to be a lot of advertising and very little brand. And by that, I mean, you know, some of the best luxury brands in the world, if we're talking about wealth for now, don't really do ads at all. You know, the reason you know about Loewe and, and everything they do is almost the body language of the brand and every touch point and all of its, you know, commentary and all of its controversies created by other stuff, you know, and Pharrell and what he's doing, relaunching the millionaires. We're all going to want a pair of those shades in three months. Trust me. Um, none of that's advertising, you know, and, that, and that's the body language of the whole experience of the brand. And I think that's the other thing in, in wealth, particularly they've completely forgotten. Um, well, you know, we mentioned this when we were chatting yesterday, like, this wealth segment I find fascinating from a brand perspective, but, you know, it, it used to be cool. It used to be sexy to go to work in, you know, your private banker. You have someone who's, you know, right. they're, they're sort of, they've got the Hermes tie on, they turn up at your house, they can, you know, they know your family, they can sort your life out, they can, you know, create more money. Because now it's a very dirty word, you know, and that yep. like, soul seems to be completely sucked out of them. But you mentioned luxury. Yep. And I'm interested because... You'd think that that luxury space should be where these brands would be emulating. Uh, do you agree with that? And do you think there's space for that? Well, oh, dude, I just, we, we do this exercise often. I don't know if this is an answer to your question, just an aside, but we, whenever we work with anybody, particularly really established brands, we imagine what would happen if a brand from the West Coast launched in that marketplace and what they would do. And I say the West Coast just because it puts something in your head and it gives you a certain body language and feel, but imagine a fucking cool, innovative wealth management brand from the West Coast launched and popped up. It wouldn't be marketing at all. It would be creating narrative objects. It would go, hey, our first product, by the way, is a range of boots that we've created with Samuel Ross from a Cold War, and there's only 10 of them. And our first customers get those. You'd be like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> and it would be like, well, no, of course it's going to work. Because all those customers, all they want that wealth for is access to these incredibly special totems, items, moments, or experiences. So, of course, they're going to want that. That's what a brand in that space would do. And they would take their leaves from luxury. They would take their leaves from high-end content. They would take their leaves from publishing, you know, um, and from experience. And I, I just think all of that sort of stuff has, has gone missing. But, but those body language, we call it body language. Those behaviors or body languages are the things that the category needs to shift most. You know, if I, 
if I were able to work with, with one of these companies now, I think that would be the biggest shift we could make, um, is creating what we call story objects or, or story experiences. And just at the, the other, and we'll get on to the practical stuff soon, but this is too fun, sort of navel gazing at the moment. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the, your, your, your banking relationship, I think, you know, your recent work with Monzo on the TV ad campaign mm. lent heavily into emotion. Yeah, all, it was all it was. There wasn't a single claim. You know, and, no, and, no product, no new feature uh, release, no uh, price. So, but Monzo are an amazing example. Just before we talk about the work we've made for them, just look at that brand in general, okay? The things that have moved the needle for that brand are a bright pink card, body language. The things that have moved the needle for that brand are the fact that you can freeze your card and it freezes over on your phone. You know, these are design experiences. They're not cheap. You know, they're not tactical. They're actually incredibly important. It's how Apple have succeeded. So that brand already understand that to be remarkable, the whole experience of the brand has to be remarkable. When we got into it, we had a load of people uh, draw. We like to do this. We, look, we ask a load of you know, potential punters, whatever, to draw how they feel about money. And people were just drawing the most hilarious shit. They were drawing pictures of nails in eyes and you know, smashing their head on a table and you know, hugging a cactus and feeling depressed on a Monday. And we were just like, right, that's basically it. Money is an emotional thing. And we don't have to quantify what Monzo offer you in, in the most minute detail. What we've got to do is say, there's money over here and then there's Monzo over here. And if money feels like this, Monzo feels like this. And that, that's ultimately the effect that Monzo have on the category. And I think uh, hopefully with that work and with this partnership, they're going to end up being one of the most powerful financial bodies in the UK, I think. And you did it previously with, with Habito, because uh, we were speaking to Dan, uh, the founder of, of Habito. Well, and, Dan, and, by the way, always yeah, got to he, Dan Higgerty. He's a very special person. He's an amazing, an amazing thinker, amazing the amount of depth he can go into, whether it's product, uh, marketing, like his knowledge around brand was fantastic. But uh, he was talking about, to us about um, Habito and he basically said like the insight that they found around mortgages was that it felt closer to being disemboweled than, than anything else. And it's like, it's so emotional and yeah. so powerful. And that's what led the campaign. That was it. At the moment, I mean, 100%, but at the moment you talk about getting a mortgage and all the marketing has a lens flare of you and your, your kid and your missus looking out of a window and you're like, oh my yeah. God. Keys you're like, in hand. That's not the reality. And, and man, we kept pulling at that string with Dan and, and he's always had a great respect and admiration, I think, for, for the truth of the moment. And um, we discovered some other stuff. You know, we discovered that people's sex lives never suffer more than when they're trying to get a mortgage. We were like, well, that's an amazing, amazing truth. So we wrote an erotic bestseller with Rocky Flintstone that was number two in the Amazon, <laughs> in the Amazon chart. I remember now, this. Know, yeah, like uh, Road to Completion, it was called. Yeah. And uh, now that sounds incredibly trashy, doesn't it? It sounds funny. And if you're a CF, CFO or CMO of a major bank, you're listening to that, you're going, what? But that told a story immediately about Habito recognizing their truth and their place in your world. And I think that's super interesting, you know, and Dan has always had form there. And, and that's, you know, that kind of speaks in that disruptive space uh, that you guys are fantastic at. And also those brands need to be disruptive. And um, what I'd like to do is, is kind of change gears and get into the, the practical. Yep. Um, so, so imagine, you know, we have CMOs listening. They range the spectrum of huge institutional uh, banks, wealth managers, uh, fintechs, all the way down to, you know, your, your, your disruptive, innovative founder. Um, can you give us a blueprint? Or if you had to give a blueprint for that successful relation, relationship with an agency, you know, and how you solve those problems of someone coming in and, and de-risking the whole project, um, where would you start? Uh, I mean, God, what a question. I, as I say, I think most of our partnerships and, and the most successful versions of events start with really an alignment up front about why you're talking to each other. And you have to be very honest with yourself and then with your agency or studio partners. But, you know, really, I suppose this is maybe best summed up in, in a simple question, which is what's scarier? What will happen if we do this or what will happen if we don't? And um, most of those relationships, I think you've got to really ask yourself that question because I think everyone loves to say, we want out of the box thinking, we want this and this and this, because that's where they think that that's what they think the money's buying. But actually, if they're not in need of it, if they don't really understand the shift it can make, if they don't really believe in that sense of change, then ultimately what's going to happen is you're just going to waste each other's time for six months. Um, and so I think the first thing that, that any CMO can do is really inquire as to, to what success looks like. Not 
output in terms of subscriptions or whatever, but the, the path to it, you know, is it reappraisal? Is it fame? Is it to be completely associated forever with one emotion? Is it to, for someone in a pub to say something, you know, and I actually think all these parameters and KPIs are perfectly acceptable, if, if not more important than the numeric ones. Um, you know, so I think that initial agreement and that sort of pact you make with each other, I think is the first thing I'd say that, that's really, really important. We talk a lot about candor, which is uh, an underused word these days, but the ability to critique each other without ego, to say, I just don't like that or I don't think that's very good. Um, we have a lot of that in the studio. That's how we get to a lot of our work. Um, but we have a lot of it with our clients. You know, we have pretty punchy meetings with our clients. You know, they're, they're pretty open and they're pretty punchy and we, we have a lot of it out. Um, and then I look, and, and then I think there's a, there's really a sharing of cultures. And I, I think the biggest danger in creativity is that a creative director or team or agency don't really understand what they mean by it. And so they go, this is good work. Well, what sort of good work? Because one person's good work is seamlessly consistent. One person's good work is radically famous. One person's good work is, well, it works from the shelf back. Like, that's a massive statement. So an alignment on what you think good is. And I, I would argue even down to the media, what's a great poster? Is it remarkable? Does it have something new about it or original? How will people share it? Is it going to stop them in their tracks? If you're writing, does it have a conviction that's going to align with someone's values? Are you saying something in a new way that's going to become a meme or a, or a sticky piece of language? Like there are simple questions we ask of almost every part of the process that we try to share with our partners. So there isn't this, this mist of what good looks like. Um, it sounds like a lot of hard work, but I think the more you do that up front, the easier it is to create the sort of work you wish you were making. And I guess it's, I guess what you're saying is almost just like set that bar very high and don't let it drop. Very. And, and be clear with, with your partners about the reason for that. This isn't some indulgence where we want to go pick up an award, man. We want to matter and be referred to. This matters to both of us. Do you want to be talking about this in a year on a stage? I do. That's okay. You know, would you like to get paid more as a result of it? Yes. Would you like the market cap of the company to go up 100%? All of that's associated with fame, with brand, with story, with being referenced. Um, and the more open and brazen you are about that and the less shy you are about that, the better. Um, you know, I think, I think that's important. And by the way, that's a very creative um, task. I, I think this in agencies, this, uh, oh, I think we've kind of crucified ourselves a bit as creatives to, to believe that we do the coloring in and someone else talks about what success might look like or, or you know, but no one can better is, express the emotion and, and the real story of a piece of work than a creative. You know, so I've always loved Gilbert and George, you know, make the world to believe in you, to pay heavily for the privilege. Most creatives in this industry aren't okay with saying, this is what I am worth. This is what we are worth. This is what my thinking is worth. And the moment you become okay with that, you actually become okay with telling a client what this is going to do for them, for their money, for their bottom line. And, and suddenly that conviction and that confidence really, which is all you've got to go on, frankly, um, becomes very compelling. You know, and, and actually then at that point, the creative, I think, in that sense, becomes the perfect right hand for a, for a good CMO. Well, I think what we're kind of dancing around, right, is ROI. And, yeah. you know, that is one of the things that I can see. So one is, you know, risk. But one of the things I can see derailing, uh, you know, a perfect partnership and great creative is CEO, CFO saying, well, where's the ROI on this? And, you know, slowly losing confidence that that's going to come in. And as soon as you have knocked that confidence, it, it knocks everything else off. But when I think of, you know, ROI, it actually, it only pays for itself when you do great work. It doesn't work if you're just doing, you know, you're going through the motions. Oh, tick box, we've done a social campaign or tick box, we've done all of this. So how do you think about ROI? I love what you just said. I mean, I heard this great phrase the other day that's between dog and wolf. And I think most marketing ends up there which is we almost did something good, but then we pulled back a bit. And those bits that we pretend don't matter really matter. And it's the difference between the work being remarkable, ferociously different, provocative, all those great words. That's the difference is the entire process and your ability to protect it together. Um, ROI, though, is a really interesting term for me because I, I look at the work we do, particularly with brand, and I immediately think immediately about the employees and the company itself. That's the first place I'd start, which is, the CFO of every company rolls their eyes at creativity until you say, we're going to hire you better people for less money because they're going to want to work here more than anywhere else in your category. 
and they're going to want to do that because they're going to see you as the most creative, the most cool, the most modern, and the most powerful company in your space. At that point, they start really understanding what we mean by brand. Because otherwise, brand, creativity, these are weak words and easily assassinated in a boardroom, I think. Um, and so the moment you go, well, imagine I replaced half your people with people that worked you know, far faster, far harder for far longer because they absolutely adored your narrative and mission. And they got out of bed every morning to try and matter in that company. Well, way before we get to consumers, that's already very, very valuable. You know, I mean, I'd love an example of this from you, but, I, but again, speaking in this finance space and thinking of the CMOs I've been speaking to recently over the last year, like employee MPS, I know is so high on their agenda because like we were speaking about before, trust is a means if you're selling trust, you're in a word of mouth business. And if your staff are your sales force and they're going out and meeting yeah. clients, potential clients, and they're going in with storytelling, excitement, energy, you're going to have an impact on, yeah. on that bottom line. Well, and when we started, there, yeah, when, like, when we started speaking to British Airways, and I think this might be hopefully a useful story for you, you know, they'd come out of COVID, they'd lost billions. They'd lost, I think, their sense of who they were and what they were about. And as our flag carrier, by the way, I think so had the UK, you know, a bit. We, you know, Brexit, all the above, scratching our heads, like, what are we really about? And the, the idea we landed on for them, the brand thought and narrative we've landed on for them is a British original. You know, and that really primarily, way before we get to any of the work we've made, was about saying, that's why you're here. You guys are a British original. You were an original when you, you created Concord, when you made the first flights to places no one had ever flown to. Your staff are originals. They're not taught to be servile robots. You know, they're taught, and, and, and the culture there is to bring their originality to bear. Um, you know, and really, if you look at that roadmap, and you're Sean, the CEO, who, who you know, and Callum and Hamish, who we have a great relationship with, if you're those guys and you wake up every morning going, we are trying to be the most original and create the most original experience for our customers, for the people that fly with us. What a brilliant mission that is, you know, in the wake of sustainability and in the wake of what airlines doing this, you know, right now and in the wake of travel and Brexit and separation and division to chase originality and original experiences for people way before you get into the advertising is a really powerful, motivating thought. Now, I think all of that, if you, if you fly on a BA plane now, you watch an original safety briefing, you open a menu that says our British original menu and every, every item on that menu is a, is, is a brilliant UK, you know, food sourcer, wine grower, whatever. You turn on your entertainment system and there's a section called British Originals. The whole way through that experience, they're living it, man. And the only reason I make that point is that's a multiplier. So then suddenly we do some advertising that people might like, like Windows or Purpose Your Visit, and that chimes with people and how they're feeling. That plus the whole experience of flying with that airline, that's a reappraisal moment. You know, so the ROI on that, yes. They're doing incredibly now as a business, and we're really proud of our part in that. But the ROI and all of that is that their crew, you know, of which they have hundreds of thousands of people, that their people, their company are waking up and believing in something far bigger than just going to work. And that, honestly, that's one of the best examples. That well, I think, I, think that, I think that just sort of ties a knot on this ROI conversation, right? Like you said to me, we don't just create ads. You know, that's one thing we can do and we do very well. But if you're really trying to drive that investment, you don't just need buy-in. A brand level you need buying across the experience so how do you get that then to have a knock-on effect you know you, you go from the your discussions with the c-suite you've got the cmo gets it gets the vision but to then change a company the size of ba or, or even bigger how does that work and how do you do that well uh i mean the first is you know i'm going to try and be as candid and as honest as i can with you um how much of the pie do you really want and i'm saying this to the agency people listening and how much of the pie are you really able to change, amend, push, improve? The reason I say that is I'm common or obsessed with, with uh, getting as much access as we can possibly get to the small forgotten areas of a brand. I want to I talk about whether we can change what the contract looks like, the wording of the contract, the wording of the first email you get on day one, the wording of um, the, the signage in the HQ, you know, what it smells or feels like to be in the building. Like these things, if you have a partner that cares as much about these things as the CMO does, suddenly there is no division. You're both on the same page. In fact, you're racing to matter most. You know, and I, I kind of look at all of that and just go, that's the first step, by the way, which is all these small differences we've talked about are the body language of a brand in change. And I think the more you, you are adept and able to do that, the, the, the better you are equipped to, to make a difference. Um, so things like design are exponentially important, physicality, environment, 
um, culture, you know, company narrative, people narrative, HR. These are the places that a brand really lives, you know, and, and often what happens is great marketing comes and goes with a marketing director on LinkedIn in 18 months instead of great branding and a great brand lives throughout the organization. It's undeniable, you know, and, and lastly on that, dude, I, I should have said this to you earlier. I think the right brand idea um, really is a compass. That's the best thing it does is it becomes a way of making a decision. So you kind of go, look, instead of do I like this or don't I, is that brave or isn't it? Well, if we're about British originality, what do we believe this needs to be every time? Okay, great. We're both on the same page when we're making these decisions. You know, if we're about more than TV for ITV, well, we know we can't just advertise a new show. You know, we have to matter in the, in the lives of, of the British people. We have to hold a mirror up to our mental health and to the way families are behaving. Of course we do. We're about more than TV. We're the biggest broadcaster in the UK. So all that stuff becomes a compass for decision making. And I think that's really powerful for a CMO, by the way, because it protects them from the cynics in their organization, of which there are loads. We call them dementors. Every, every place has them. You know the, the dementors in Harry Potter that turn up yeah, and kind of go, Whoa. I know they were. There's always someone, and I don't know why, but there is. And they can often be very lovely people, but there is always a dementor in every organization. And, and I think it's rooted in a fear of change and a fear of difference. But someone somewhere will, will get in your way. And often that's the world saying, how much do you really want this? Because new stuff isn't easy. And I think the way through that is to have a compass you all agree is the right one. Have an idea that helps you make those decisions and protect them. You know, and, and you do that as a team. But how do you do that well? Because again, thinking from like a, a, a scaling fintech product background, we'll run A-B tests and we'll notice, okay, this has got 2% better conversion rate after the first week. So we're going to double down on that and we're going to run a, a load of different iterations. If you're thinking about a brand experience at that level, you're, you're placing a bet. So how comes your bets work when others don't? Oh, God. I mean, hopefully everything I've just said starts to evidence that we very much are in it with our partners. And I, I don't mean that in a sort of boastful, crappy benefit of uncommon way. I mean it sincerely. Everything we do in the studio is something else we don't do. If we spend a year working with ITV and we make bad work, we haven't just made some bad work, man. We spent a year and lost a year that we could have been making brilliant work. The reason I make that clear is it really matters to us that the output of the studio with our clients is incredible. Because if it's not, we haven't just made slightly less good work, man. We've lost time. And that's the most precious thing. We'll never get that back. And so uh, being in it with them and it mattering as much to us that it works and it mattering as much to us that the output is what we agreed it would be in meeting one is, is the first part of this step. We're not cynics. We're not chasing revenue. We don't really care about that. We know that distinctive, remarkable partnerships that make reference point work are going to be the thing that move us forward. We know that. The studio has proven that to itself. You know, so I think at that point, if that's the game, um, all we can do is find those right partners. The other thing is, ultimately, and I say this about AJ Coyne, I say this about Hamish Vey, I say this about Rufus and Paul Risdale at ITV, I say this about, you know, Susie Watford, who we work with at SiriusXM in the States, and all of our best partners, ultimately at some point, man, you just have to align with your values, see the world a certain way and give it a go. And you have to know in your gut and your heart that you've behaved with all the professionalism you possibly can. But there is no real way to optimize and test a brand thought over time through all the experiences it could possibly live through. You just have to believe that it's going to lift everybody in that emotional way. You have to believe in emotion. You have to believe in being moved. You have to believe that humans are beings that can be influenced by words and by a story. Now that shouldn't need proving, but sometimes it does. Um, you know, and I think ultimately it comes down to that too. And how does it feel when you know, right? Like a big part of this is taste for sure. You know, you'll know, you'll see what the output is going to be months before it ever gets there. What does it feel like when you like, this is it, this is, this is worth taking a bet on? Yeah, it's thrilling. And, and sometimes deeply cruel because when you get to something you know is fucking great, you then spend the next seven months paranoid it's going to die. Um, you know, when you find new things, um, that's the rarest in the world. Honestly, it then becomes the emotion completely flips and it becomes a race to make it real. And that can be incredibly frustrating, you know, but 
I've also been taught patience and wisdom by, by a lot of our great partners. You know, Kellen Lamming at, at BA, you know, he's in charge of the entire customer experience in that company. That's a long game, man. You know, that's not, you know, what one-off ad are we going to run that's going to, you know, the, the, there was this sense when we started with the idea that I was very much in a rush. I always am. I, but, you know, have this statement, later means never, which is like whenever a client says to you, yeah, we'll do that later. Usually it means we're never going to fucking do that. And so I've, I've almost... It's on, uh, it's on the board behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually I've, I've told myself that in order to motivate myself and the crew that, that we just have to make these things now. But but when you're trying to reprint 100,000 menus or when you're trying to make it onto the entertainment system of a plane, yeah. you have to have that sense of, of long game. And so, you know, it's a very noble house view of the world. But I'm like, actually, the output of that, I think, will be as powerful as some of the best work we've ever made. Um, you know, I think, so I think that I've learned some stuff there about that too. Listen, there's one other thing as well, just on it, which is like, I just think, um, I don't know. No, it's fine. I, I was just going to say, I think the reminder of a lot of this is, is just way back to that original question, which is you and, and one or two people really wanting change more than anybody else. And, I think we are adepts at articulation and this is a bit under the, under the covers, but fuck it. Um, Thomas Heatherwick gave this speech. I saw he's a friend of the studios. We've done some work together. He's an amazing, remarkable human. One of the most articulate people I've ever met. Someone asked him at a conference he did. There's a load of advertising people. They said, Thomas, you're known as a wizard in the boardroom. How do you do it? And he said, you guys, you know, are obsessed with selling. He said, you know, did you sell it? Didn't you sell it? How did you sell it? He said, but let me put it to you like this. You know, and did the client buy it? And oh, the fucking client didn't buy it. You know, they weren't brave enough, this old chat. And he said, let me put it to you like this. Someone gives me a million pounds to come up with an idea for them. A million pounds. And I can't tell them about the idea in a way that makes them not just want to do it, but have to do it. How could that be their fault? No, I'm just, how could that be their fault? It's tr- how? Can it possibly be their fault? They're paying you. How could it be their fault? And I was like, I love the emphasis you put on us. It's all on us. If you don't sell something, it's not on them. It's on your articulation, your compass, your framework for how you talk about that idea. And by the way, uncommon, man. Everyone assumes we have these brilliant clients, very easy clients who love what we do immediately. I don't know why, but there is this assumption that we work with these people. I'm not saying they're not that. I'm not saying <laughs> but they're hard. You know, they're hard. They're professionals. They've been around. You know, they're not fucking easy. Yeah difference man is the framework for an idea and when i say framework i don't mean in one meeting i mean during the entire lifespan of our relationship how am i talking about this idea how am i the woods are burning think about it it's me setting a context for a need for a certain type of work and a certain level and i set that meeting one now you can do that internally the reason i'm making this clear to you is like cmos they should be doing the same thing in their organization how do you create the confines for for work that's unafraid well, first of all, you have to have a threat bigger than making that work. So how do you, that's our strategy, you know, and by the way, there is always one of those. That's sort of it. I love that. And it also, you know, the, if, if you're trying to answer the question, like how do you get people, to, how do you get your business to care about brand, then, then that's it, you know, yeah. instantly brings urgency to it. Like the risk of not doing this is bigger than the one that is. Yeah. Um, Niels, look, thank you so much for your time today. It's been incredible. I ask all of our guests the same question at the end. Um, which is pretty much just looking for advice. Okay, so imagine you're sat in front of the CMOs of the the future of CMOs of the finance industry, and you know you could give them one piece of advice. What would that be? <laughs> oh. Uh. I would say that there hasn't been an industry or a category that has needed uh, difference and help and education in the most entertaining and remarkable way uh, than the finance category. And the reason I say that is it's not a category that could just do with some slightly better marketing. The world doesn't understand its relationship with money. And the world doesn't know what saving is and understand it. And the world doesn't know the power of, of the freedom and the independence that money can bring. And we are lost in a crazy commercialized 
fear-ridden um, cyclone, I think. And the temptation is to try and make the best of that in your jobs as CMOs and, and play a part in this cyclone. But the best people will find a way to turn that on its side. You know, and the woods burning are, are bigger and, and more brazen and more hot in that category than any other in the world. And so if you wake up and you're in charge of the biggest brands, and I've always believed, by the way, that this isn't the, the remit of startups and challenges, quite the opposite. The bigger the brand, the bigger the problem you can take on. Wouldn't it be incredible for the biggest brands in wealth and finance to renegotiate the world's view and relationship with money? That's what's up for grabs. And the output of that is that the gravestones we talked about earlier in this will have your name on it. That someone in 20 years will say, do you remember dot, dot, dot. That, you know... Um, your family, your relatives, your friends, the, the, you know, will refer to the work you've made and the output and the things you've done. And that's a brilliant place to be. Love it. Well, you can end this episode any better. Uh, like I said, Nils, everyone's been hassling me to make sure that I come and find you and uh, get to pick your brains on creativity. But uh, thank you for the work that uh, you've put out and thanks for the message that seems to have lit a fire under everybody. Thank you, I hope I've done that justice, God knows, but um, I enjoyed the <laughs> chat. Thank you so much, dude. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, mate. Bye.